Motorola, what do you think of when you hear that name? Because it's probably different depending on your age. If you're around my age group, which I think most of my audience is, you think of cell phones. I had one of these Razer V3s in high school and it was by far the coolest thing that I owned. If you're in a younger age group, you may not know that name at all. And if you're in an older age group, you may be thinking of one of many things. There have been so many changes that I doubt hardly anybody realizes the full extent of Motorola. So that's my intention of this video, to bring everybody up to speed with each other and talk about eight separate products that have been significant to them over the past over 100 years. Trust me, they're going to build as they go, but I need to start with batteries. Now, these were not technically significant themselves, or even sold by Motorola for that matter, but they did lead to the formation of Motorola. Let me explain. In 1920, soon after returning home from World War I, Paul Galvin was working for a company that made storage batteries. After a year of learning that business, he got together with a friend of his named Edward Stewart to start their own company that would sell these batteries. That new business did not do so well. After a couple of years, they fell behind on their taxes and the government forced them to shut down. Then, three years later, in 1926, they effectively tried it again, starting a new business that again, wasn't doing very well. A big reason that they were having so much trouble was simply that they were in the wrong business. This makes us remember how long ago this was, but in the 1920s, electricity was taking off in popularity. It was considerably cheaper than it had been in the years before, so everybody was starting to use that instead of batteries. The battery market was falling and nobody wanted their product. However, they did respond to this with a pretty clever adjustment. Instead of trying to fight electricity and swim against the current, they decided to go with the flow by introducing battery eliminators. That is actually my second one on the list. If you had a radio that only ran on batteries, a battery eliminator would allow you to instead plug that radio into the wall. Since electricity was the new big thing, they were proving to be more popular than the batteries. It's kind of funny to me because they were simultaneously selling batteries and a device that eliminated your need for batteries, sort of competing against themselves. Maybe that's part of the reason that for a second time, the business failed. I don't mean to laugh, but these were ridiculously tough beginnings for Paul Galvin. I have to admit that two failed companies within a few years would probably discourage me from trying it again. But you have to admire how he just kept at it. Even though it hadn't gone well, he still saw potential in selling those eliminators. So when the assets of the partnership went up for auction, he gathered $750, went down to that auction, and bought the eliminator portion of the business to use as a foundation to start his third business. This time, he partnered with his brother, Joseph Galvin, to form Galvin Manufacturing Corporation, a name that was later changed to Motorola. Their first big customer was Sears Roebuck and Company, who would buy them in large quantities and resell them to the consumers. So finally, after so much struggle, Paul Galvin was on track and running a successful business. But you have to feel bad for him at this point, because the new company was started in 19. 1928, one year before the Great Depression. Concerning battery eliminators, the demand for them was down, for obvious reasons, while others had been entering the market, raising the supply. That is a bad combination that caused sales to fall, and once again, Paul Galvin found himself in the wrong business. While searching for new products, he discovered a potentially strong market for radios, specifically car radios. Cars themselves were newly popular, and all the existing radios for them were really expensive and didn't even have that good of reception. That market was seen as being wide open, so he and his team created something that not only worked better, but sold for nearly half the price of any other radio on the market. To brand these radios, he combined the words Motor and Victrola into the word Motorola, which, of course, 17 years later became the name of the entire company. It was a fitting name, too, because this is what they quickly became most known for. Later that decade, they expanded into home radios, and by the 1950s, they started working with NASA on the space program. In fact, in 1969, when Neil Armstrong said those famous first words on the moon, Fun 
That was transmitted through radio equipment that was made by Motorola. So Motorola has historically been one of the biggest, most important names in radio. It's what first made them big, it's where they got their name, and it was the core of their business for decades. The reason many people may not know this today is because they started phasing out their production of car radios in the late 1970s and haven't made them at all since 1983. The next one on the list does involve radios, but I thought it was big enough to talk about separately, walkie talkies. because. Because, well, Motorola invented walkie-talkies. In the 1930s, Paul Galvin correctly predicted that World War II was on the way and figured that the soldiers could greatly benefit from a means to communicate as they walked around. They already had radios in their vehicles, but no way to communicate long distances while they were on foot. In 1940, they introduced what they called the Handy Talkie. It used AM frequencies to communicate from up to a mile away, but the more significant invention was, of course, three years later when they invented the walkie-talkie. It was much heavier and more cumbersome, they had to put it on like a backpack, but it used FM frequencies that allowed people to communicate from 20 times the distance with much clearer reception. So that one's pretty cool, and considering that they were used during the war, I have to think that they have saved the lives of many people. Alright, the next product on my list is televisions, because in the early days of television, Motorola was one of the biggest makers of them. As early as 1947, they introduced their first one. It was the start of their Golden View line of televisions. It was attractively small and, again, priced at $179.95, it was among the most affordable on the market. Within one year, they sold over 100,000 of them, and within seven years, they were controlling 10% of that market. For a few months in the 1950s, they even aired the Motorola Television Hour on ABC, intended to entice people into buying televisions. In 1967, they started the Quasar brand, who became another big name in TVs that they were behind, until seven years later when they sold it to the company that became Panasonic. And they actually sold the Quasar brand as part of their strategy at the time to move away from consumer electronics like radios and televisions in favor of focusing on semiconductors. Obviously, today there's a big battle between Intel and AMD, but there was a time when it was sort of between Intel and Motorola. Now, we are getting pretty deep into technology here, so for my own sake and probably many of yours, I'm going to keep this at a high level. See, in the 1950s, Motorola started a semiconductor products division. A decade earlier, the transistor had been invented, Motorola got permission to utilize it for their own radios, and that led to them making them for other companies' products, so they started a division for it. Well, by the 1970s, they were really getting serious about it when they introduced their first microprocessor, the 6800, later followed by the 68000, and they became really big in the industry. Probably the most notable thing to say about it is the first Apple computer and everyone that followed it for years was made with a microprocessor made by Motorola. The basic issue here was that the much larger IBM chose Intel for their microprocessor in their first PC and that was a pretty big push for them. It's a deep subject that deserves to be talked about in its own video but for today I just want to convey that for about 30 years Motorola was one of the world's largest producers of semiconductors. In 1999 they spun off part of that business into its own company called ON Semiconductor, and then in 2003, they spun off the rest of the business into another separate company called Freescale Semiconductor, which has since been merged into NXP Semiconductors. All right, moving on to the next product, which is pagers, because I would argue that Motorola is the biggest name ever in pagers. Now, they didn't invent them, but they did come up with the name pager, and they did make the first successful consumer pager. It was called the Pageboy One in 1964. It didn't even have a display. It would just communicate to the person using different types of beeps. By the 1990s, they were producing 85% of all the pagers in the world before they stopped making them altogether in 2001. What I'm saying is if you find an old pager from somewhere from before that year, there is a really good chance that it was made by Motorola. Now, can you believe that I have talked about all of this stuff involving Motorola and I haven't even mentioned their cell phones? Well, I have to talk about the cell phones because Motorola is credited with inventing the cell phone. Engineer Martin Cooper, while working for Motorola, made the first ever call using a cell phone. It seemed like a real power move too because for that first call, Martin called one of his competitors over at Bell Labs of AT&T to essentially tell him that he had won the race. Ten years later, after spending hundreds of millions of dollars on cell towers and other infrastructure necessary to make the network functional, Motorola released
released the first ever commercially available cell phone. It was called the Dynatac 8000X and it cost $3,500. Six years later, they introduced a much smaller, in my opinion, cooler looking phone called the Microtac. And in 1996, they introduced the Motorola StarTac, which many consider to be the first ever widely popular cell phone. Around that time, more than half of all the cell phones sold were made by Motorola. At their peak, they had a 60% share of the market that was reduced to 16% over the next 10 years, and then they became mostly insignificant not long after. Just to give the simple answer as to what happened there is they were slow to adapt to digital technology over analog, and by 1998, they had allowed Nokia to pass them. It is worth mentioning though that they had a bit of a resurgence in 2004 when they debuted the Razer. I mean, come on, as I said in the beginning, I have to think that for many of the people watching this, including myself, that's what you think of when you hear the name Motorola. It was a top selling phone until Apple released the iPhone in 2007 and smartphones took over soon after. And even then, the Droid, running on Android, was a significantly popular cell phone put out by Motorola. Then in 2011, the company essentially spun off their entire mobile business, along with their cable boxes and a few other things, into its own separate company called Motorola Mobility. While the original company, now consisting of products that they made for the government and other big companies that the public typically wouldn't see, continued operating under the new name Motorola Solutions. I know it gets tricky, but Motorola Mobility was then bought by Google for $12.5 billion in 2012, who then sold them to Lenovo in 2014 for just under $3 billion, but Google did hold on to thousands of patents that Motorola had accumulated, which is likely a big reason Google bought them in the first place. So Motorola has kind of broken down into different parts to a point where they don't really resemble the company that I've been talking about throughout this video. Let me know in the comments, did you know that Motorola had such historical significance? I'm guessing that you didn't know all of this, so which part of the video were you most surprised to hear? They did start out slow by selling batteries and battery eliminators, but then they either invented or helped develop or popularized multiple things that are still used in our everyday lives. I mean, how many companies have had a significant role in both World War II and the moon landing? To me, Motorola is a company that just gets overlooked and should be more recognized for all of the stuff that they've done. So any thoughts you have about Motorola or their extensive list of products over the years, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.